Hello and welcome to At The 55, your home for OUA football. Me and Tom are back on the mics following a excruciatingly exciting <laughs> week four. And I say excruciating solely to poke a little more fun at my co-host here, Tom. Tom, I, I would say that in many ways this week lived up to the billing. I'd say it was many things that we thought, a few things specifically we didn't think it would be, and one thing in particular that uh, is obviously driving the the little bit of teasing I'm throwing your way. But before we get into that, and I ask this with, well, still some level of teasing, but a certain <laughs> level of true sincerity and care, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna refrain from my. How the heck are you? Tom, how are you how are you doing, man? Are you, are are you okay? Are, you know you... what? I'm not doing well, Zach. All right, <laughs> I'm not doing well. <laughs> Tom, obviously, we're talking about uh, your McMaster Marauders losing to my Guelph Griffins. Oh, now they're your Guelph Griffins, eh? It's pretty freaking convenient. <laughs> yeah, I'm a real stinker like that. No, but Tom, do you catch more? Like, I feel like you catch bullets from both sides of the coin on this one like it's yeah. either the Guelph guys giving you crap for picking against them and they pick up a win or it's the Mac guys being like hey man like ease up on us like you can't you can't win at least when I picked against Guelph and they pick up the win I have a certain level of like whoa <laughs> the Ron Joyce curse is over wow how about that yeah. you know hey the one thing the Shan era of uh, Guelph Griffins football can hold over our Stu Lang era that they won a game in Hamilton perhaps the only thing they can hold over us but uh uh-huh yeah it's uh <laughs> Yeah, it's it's tough sledding over here, Zach. I get yeah. I get all of the chirping and none of the praise. It's it's so much fun. Yeah, uh, it is the life of an offensive lineman, and I suppose in many ways, it's just you living that true self as an offensive lineman to the core now in your retired stage. But we have two other games to get to before we get to that one, and of course, before we get to any of these games, like we do on all our review podcasts, we'll hand out a little hardware and oftentimes I hand the mic to you for the first offensive player of the week award that we give and like a few weeks we've had or at least one in particular we're going back to the well and we're going to a guy that I'm going to take the opportunity here to give the shout out to not that I don't throw my fair share of praises at his feet it's got to be Taylor Elgersma it's there's no other way to to put it goes 20 for 27, 318 yards and five touchdowns. And we'll get into this game. It's the first one we have on our slate that we want to talk about. And you can say what you want about the level of competition, though I, I take nothing back that, from what I said about the early returns of that Waterloo defense and looking quite promising. But Tom, like what would like if we going into going into this week, if I told you that Elgersmo was going to throw five touchdowns, and not a single one would go to Ethan Jordan or Raiden Thorne. Like, how quickly would you have, like, you know, me locked up in the loony bin for <laughs> for that? Like, it's 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 bonkers. It's absolutely wild. This kid is coming into his own halfway through the season, which is like the perfect time to start peaking. Man, this is nuts. And this Waterloo defense, we talked about it last week. They're nothing to the uh, nothing to sneeze at. Like these guys are pretty good. So, yeah, he puts up five touchdowns here, but the fact that he doesn't go to Jordan or Thorne, his two favorite receivers, and pretty much everybody else gets one is just wild. Uh, you know, I I have so many more comments, but obviously we'll save that for very briefly when we get into that. A number of other great performers on the offensive side of the ball, but you know, it just Battle of Waterloo in Laurier. He's been on this hot streak. You and Jack picked him as your uh, MVP candidate for the year. And it's just, it, it's all taking shape. This team is living up to the billing. They're living up to the hype, not only that folks like Jack Moore, and then as a result of him coming on the pod and hyping us up. <laughs> that we exalted and of course this Laurier team themselves hyping themselves up is uh it's a beautiful thing to see 
it's a beautiful thing to see. We'll obviously talk about some of the other performers around the league when we get to those games uh, because this is just such a great week of football. Um, put aside some of the emotional ties that uh, left uh, some of us in, in shambles. Defensive <laughs> player of the week, I will throw that one your way and uh, you know talk about uh, picking at a, a sore uh, point for you here, Tom, because I know where you're going. Uh, who are you shouting out? Yeah, yeah, I uh, I'm just really rubbing salt salt in the wound already, but f- f- through watching these games, I think it has to go to Javon Jacobson, uh, Will linebacker for these Guelph Griffins. He finishes with ten total tackles, one for loss, and a an game icing interception uh, late into the fourth quarter. There, he just he was playing lights out. I, there was a couple of times where I remember him just like completely upturning certain uh running backs as they were coming over for screens or, or just for quick out routes he was he was just fantastic for these guys and uh yeah i i'm i'm nothing if not a graceful loser that's what i'll say so it has to go to jacobson yeah i, I certainly can't uh claim that title for myself either but that's where we balance each other out and we'll certainly get to that game for me i'm gonna go to one jackson finley he had the 95 yard uh pick six for western in the early third quarter in that game of course given the nature of the final score hard not to shout out a defensive guy who has that type of an impact on the outcome and really uh you know uh i can't wait to talk about that game for so many reasons Mm -hmm. and you know Alex Vreekin was looking pretty good, and it was looking like a really nice drive. He was putting together four queens in that third quarter, opening up the uh, the second half, and then just one of the few mistakes he made on the day, and uh, and Finley did the rest. Um, so shout out to Jackson Finley on that one. We'll we'll get to that one as the last game on our slate. Not before though, we move over to special teams. Tom, who are you liking? When you're looking at everything here, I think it has to go to Brady Lister, uh, kicker for Windsor Lancers. He goes four for four on field goals, four for four on extra points for a total of 16 points over these Ottawa GGs. Uh, the kid was just automatic as anytime they needed to to get a field goal here. So um, my my pick's going with Lister. The pride of St. Thomas, Ontario. I believe a former Parkside Stampeder himself. I think he played some quarterback there as well. So, you know, maybe keep that open in the in the future if Windsor's ever looking for some <laughs> trick plays. Uh, you know, when you when you score 52 points, uh, a kicker is a, a great place to look for a special teams player of the week. And we have established with bylaw number. I'm not going to try to remember the random number I threw out when I made up the bylaw that any and all gaudy stats accumulated against the York Fighting Lions does allow said individual or team to be shouted out. And of course, in this individual, those 52 points are belonging to the Carlton Ravens, 14 of which belong to Brandon Forcier, three for three on field goals, five for six on extra points. And like I'll admit, I wasn't really watching this game. I did try to pull the four simultaneous screens, and it wasn't a factor of just the nature of how this game was going, but also because of the two camera setup panning left and right, and just ah, oh, you know what? Actually, we goofed, man. Ottman Brom got a punt return touchdown in that game. He deserves a <laughs> shout out too. But you know, also my point of being like, I wasn't really paying attention to this game, not just because I thought it was going to be a bit of a stinker, which you know it was, but also because you know, with the way they set up at York, despite how beautiful a stadium it is, they got one camera pointing left, they got one pointing right, and they just pan back and forth. And on that Brom punt return touchdown, they clearly had the one set up for where he was receiving the ball. And then once he crossed the 55, someone fell asleep at the wheel. So, you know what? I'll split the baby on that one between Forcier and Braum. Apparently, Forcier also cred with a punt return of nine yards. Uh, Something something funky was going on in Toronto uh, over the weekend. But uh, those are our players of the week. We'll obviously get into the details of those games uh, momentarily. And before we dive into the first one, uh, obviously, you're hearing this if you're tuning in at the moment of the release of the video or the podcast. As always, thank you for tuning in, however you're tuning in and consuming our content a day later, though, than we normally would. And in letting the fine folks in the Twitterverse and people who follow us know that it was going to be a bit later, um, 
you know, we put the call out for questions if you had anything you want us to address on the pod. And what a, 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 a beautiful return of questions that we we did receive. Thank you, as always, just for engaging with our content in whatever way that you are. Now, as we said last week, we did want to take the post week five. So next week's pod, the week five review podcast as a moment to do a bit of our halfway point check in when teams will have played at least four games. And Tom, you know, you're plugged in with our, our replies, our mentions, our DMS on Twitter. A lot of those questions did kind of connect with some of those things that we wanted to touch on. So, I mean, as always, thank you to everyone who, who, who reached out to us. Was there anything I'm missing? Like some, some of the questions or comments kind of related to the games and we'll touch on those as we get into them, but was is there anything I'm forgetting that we do want to address right here and now that we're not tabling for next week? Yes, there's there's uh, one question in particular that uh, we want to I want to address on this pod, regardless of when you want to do it. We can have that conversation as well. But uh, somebody reached out to us and said, "What does Mac have to do to bounce back after this Guelph loss?" Um, so we can either answer that now or we can save it for when we talk about the game. Um, but yeah, that's definitely one that I want to, I want to dive into. Most definitely. Let's save that for when we talk about the Mac Wealth game. Uh, because I think that ties in with the narratives from you and I talking about our sort of just quick and dirty thoughts about the game, what we've thought about it, but we will get to that third because we are starting in the KW with the battle of Waterloo. Final score in this game, the Laurier Golden Hawks 47, the Waterloo Warriors 20. And, you know, as we set off the jump, this was obviously much like last week. The story, the story is Taylor Algersma. We read the stats. We'll read them again. 20 for 27, 318 yards, five touchdowns, and just miraculously enough, none of which coming at the hands of Ethan Jordan or Ray and Thorne. And, you know, last week, Jackson Stebbing's name at least came on on my radar, perhaps yours as well. You know, with the the caliber of talent of Jordan and Thorne as sort of your top two guys, and then you add in the young Oju Taleo, who Jack had mentioned to us, and of course Nelms and Scott. It's a pretty full house of skill position guys and just weapons that Elgersma has at his disposal. Stebbing's puts in some production. But now all of a sudden we got to start thinking about this Jace Atkinson who gets four <laughs> catches and 104 yards and a touchdown. I and you know we can talk about Waterloo's defense. I don't think it's a misnomer what we've seen in the early weeks. And obviously for Laurier, they were playing a Guelph defense last week that maybe the commentary about the injuries was really what it was all about, or it certainly seems like it. We'll get into more of that shortly. But, I, man, oh, man, like, whatever you want to say about calibers of opponent, what Laurie is doing right now on both sides of the ball, but we'll start offensively, is as spectacular or is perhaps the most spectacular offense we are seeing consistently from any team in the OUA. Yeah, absolutely. Like, this is this is a team, and, I, you know, we already just said it, but, like, Elgersma and the rest of this offense is starting to come alive four weeks into the OUA regular season here, starting to hit their strides, really starting to look impressive here. And regardless of what you want to say in terms of, oh, well, the caliber of opponent, whatever else, it does not matter to execute on the level that they're executing right now, regardless of who they're going up against. Oh my goodness. This is a very dangerous team here. Jace like you just go through the receiving list. Chase Atkinson, four catches, 104 yards, one touchdown. Jackson Steppings, five catches, 60 yards, one touchdown. Ethan Jordan, three catches, 38 yards. Raiden Thorne, three catches, 38 yards. That seems a little whatever. Uh, <laughs> one, uh, Tanner Nelms, one catch for 29 yards and a touchdown. Oja Talayo, one catch, 25 yards for a touchdown. Ryan Spate, two catches, 21 yards for a touchdown. Like this is absolutely insane. And when you go through a list like that and like every receiver that you dress catches a friggin' touchdown, yes, the, your receiving core is playing great, but that is just a shout out to the quarterback play that you are seeing from Elgersma. Kid is playing in lights out. And, uh, you know, obviously, as we were saying, like it's that's just the, that's the offensive side of the ball and, and defensively too. 
that, you know, sometimes we talk about teams where it's like, oh, that secondary is deadly or, oh, that front seven. You really can't look at any aspect of this defense and not be terrified because obviously we know about what Ife Anyamenem can do leading the game with eight and a half tackles. Jahari Hastings, of course, the transfer from SFU coming in here and just fitting in like a glove. You know, to skip ahead to some of the commentary we're going to have next week when we talk about potential rookies of the year and, yeah, uh, potential DPOYs, defensive player of the year is Ethan Gorsuch, what he's doing early on. I mean, Brew Baker, what he's been doing. Um, I mean, Ao Ajayi looked like he went down with an injury at some point. Didn't look too great. Don't know the stats of him. That could be something to keep an eye on as we go uh, down the line. And then, and then, of course, you add in just what Dawson Hodge does as a consistent uh, as a consistency in the kicking game like th- th- this is the crazy thing and it shouldn't surprise me of course given Jack Moore's connection with this team but like I feel like I'm literally just repeating the things he told us looking at the calendar looking at the calendar like a month and a half ago of just being like this is who this team is they know it he knew it he being Jack and y'all are gonna find out if you didn't know just at every aspect of this game they can hurt you. They can put up big numbers on offense. They can ground you. They can grind you to a halt with their ground game. And they can attack the passer in their pass rush. They have sound tacklers and they'll take the ball away as well. I mean, you know, well, obviously we're going to talk about our rankings and we'll get a whole other week of ball games to be able to digest and think about before we get there. But in the early returns, this say what you want about because to do a bit of a spoiler here, we very much have wanted to you know, pay Western their respect. They're still obviously undefeated. Hillock has been amazing, and, and I'll, I'll let you talk about Hillock till the cows come home because I know how much you've been enjoying what he's been doing. Save that. Uh, saving that aspect, Laurier is the scariest team in the OUA, hands down. You take away the, the Western factor of just like, yeah, but you don't really want to bet against them. Laurier is terrifying. One hundred percent yes and it's you know maybe it's a little bit of the bias the 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 oua not even the bias uh, itself but just like the knowledge like yes western's going to be dangerous every year yeah we know that it's almost boring at this point but you like you look at laurier and you look at the stuff that's going on with them right now like Oh my goodness quentin scott i think is starting to really come into his own and starting to take over that lead running back position with all the stuff that he's seeing obviously we've already talked about uh, Elgersma and uh, the receiving core that he's got offensive line is starting to play pretty well they're starting to get a groove here going into this and then like you said every level of that defense for Laurier like Luke Brubaker once again this guy Jack Moore knows what he's talking about when it comes to Laurier football folks Brubaker is going out and he's playing solid but his numbers don't jump off the page because they're having to account for him either running away from him double teaming him or whatever the case but he's had a sack in every game most of which have been like key moments of the game where he has come up big for this team Anya Menem is playing lights out for these these folks as well and then Gorsuch like the kid is 18 years old he's 18 (laughs) We should not be talking about him for defensive player of the year, but damn it, we are. This is nuts. Yeah, and you know what I really like as well, because we look at this water. Pardon me, we look at this Waterloo team, and you know we can maybe talk a bit about their offense, and 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 I'll, I'll throw to you in a moment whether you, you saw any of those things that we were talking about of them kind of just creating an identity. They score the twenty points. Um, you know, obviously some of that is garbage time. You know. Uh, 14 points in the se- of those coming in the second half. Um, so whether so, I'll throw out to you of just whether you felt they did start to find something of an identity, kind of regardless of of when that came about on the offensive side, but defensively, really liking this team. We've talked about Tyson Hergott now for a couple of weeks. They have a guy in James Hinsberger. I did, you know, I did figure out which of the Hinsbergers <laughs> it was. You know, uh, I haven't been hitting the head that many times. Guys like Kashawn Brown, Jack Andrews, some of these guys that are, are really solid on that defensive front seven can get after the quarterback as well. And certainly one of the questions that Jack even was, you know, willing to mention as something of a concern coming off of last year with Laurie was the player that offensive line. And as we've talked about with Western of having faith that with that kind of unit and and you know as well as I do as 
as well as a number of people who tune into our show, that with that group, that time is one of the biggest factors if you have the same five guys in that group as far as them coming together. And so I hate to kind of speed past the Waterloo comment in terms of saying that, well, you know what? Yeah, they got to they got to the QB a couple times, but on the whole, you mentioned the run game they were doing. Algersma is staying clean. He's not rushing it unnecessarily. It feels like that O-line's coming together um, and gelling at the right time. Um, so whether it's on that comment or, like I said, thinking about whether Waterloo was starting to show some signs as far as a certain cohesive, see a certain uh, identity. I mean, they certainly spread the ball out really well on the offensive side. We did see Caban come in for three um, for three uh, uh, attempts in this game as well, but obviously Orr still getting the bulk of them, going 24 for 37, 282 in the air, no TDs, and, and one interception. Um, yeah, well, from that standpoint, or, or the O-line piece for the Golden Hawks, what what kind of things are, are, are you thinking on, on those kind of pieces? Yeah, um, I had a lot of questions about this Laurier offensive line, uh, especially after the first few games that we watched from them. I think they did, obviously they've done well enough <laughs> like there's a reason why Laurier is still undefeated right now, but there's just, there was a little bit of play that I was a little concerned with because when you start playing against these teams who really have outstanding pass rushers, they can really make you pay for it. And while I have total confidence that Elgers Mud, even despite getting constant pressure in his face, could still perform at a high level, you obviously just don't want to have your quarterback doing that and making sure that you still have something of a run game to keep defenses honest. But I've I've, I've liked what I've seen from this Laurier offensive line recently. I think they're starting to gel a little bit more, and hopefully everybody can stay healthy and make sure that you know they can continue the uh, the chemistry that the the front five have for for Waterloo as a whole here. It's tough to really talk about finding an identity because you're playing against a top caliber team here. Yes, it's the Battle of Waterloo, and yes, you want to do you the absolute best you can. But like at the end of the day, this Laurier team is just flat out better than you are. So it's it's tough to kind of go about it that way. I think that the stats themselves can be a little bit skewed, exactly like you said. You know, at halftime here, it's 37 to 6 for Laurier. And, you know, Credit to Waterloo, even if the the backups are in, um, you're only allowed to dress, what, 55 players or something along those lines. So like, it's not like you can replace the entire defense. They were doing some things that were that were right. Um, and like at the end of the day, you put up 400 total uh, yards. So that's something at the very least. I think that you're if you're Waterloo, you're coming out of this game saying, there's pieces in here. There's things that I like. There's, you know, whether it's some of the offensive plays, whether it's, you know, some of the play from Nick or you're giving Nolan Cabana a chance. He gets a major or certainly like Tyson Hergott. Um, he gets another sack in this game. He plays really well once again. So I think there's, there's more and more things here. That's slowly starting to become like, Hey, this is like a rock, a solid point on, on this Waterloo team, whether it's offense, defense, or special teams. And you're starting to understand that a little bit more. Not, I, I'm not the saying that like Waterloo's going to figure it out. They're going to get into the playoffs and start <laughs> making a run for the eights cup, but you start to find uh, an identity a little bit more. You start to really understand your team. And even des depending on um, the eligibility that some of these folks have, and I don't have them off off the top of my head here, something to build around. Hey, you know what? If Hergot's got another year or two or however long, like we've got a solid staple on that defense, let's let's find some, some folks to put around them. If Nick Orr's starting to showcase a little bit more, hey, let's try to get – let's try to change the offense up a little bit. Let's try to get him more of a uh, – of like more targets than just James Basiliga, who is a, who is a phenomenal uh, receiver for them as well. But there's, if you're starting to find some, some bright spots on this team, it's, it's hopeful at the very least. Definitely. And, and obviously we, we kind of, as I said, jumped ahead to the commentary we're going to have about mid season awards, conversations, whatever you want to call it. And, Gorsuch is just above and beyond what any other first year player, unless we're just completely missing somebody out there that's just balling out more than this kid who's like top amongst the tackle uh, leaders in the league. He's got two interceptions, all these other great things. But if we were going to divide it offensive and defensively, as far as the rookie of the year piece of it, you can look to a guy in Quentin Springer. I believe he's a first year kid 
having some good having some good return so far for them. We'll have that conversation a bit more next week. To wrap this up, you know, just some of my final thoughts related to what we were talking about. You know, for Laurier, put aside the game against Guelph against a banged up front seven. And yes, can that affect how you play in the secondary? Because that's obviously where we saw them dominate and kind of where we threw out those injury pieces. As far as like, well, does missing like three of your four top front seven guys affect, you know, just the way that they were just, you know, whatever it was that happened against uh, Guelph last week. But then, you know, you look at Laurie's first two games, obviously starting against Queens, a really strong defense and a really strong front seven. A guy like Van Wisher, who's as good a pass rusher as anyone in this league. Then you look at the game they had against Carlton. Obviously, that was an immensely tough game. First outing we saw of Carlton. Obviously, we've talked about Ife Onyeka and what a great defensive lineman he is and just in general how fast that defensive line is. And that defense in general, more of a comment just on perhaps how that offensive line has been playing, how they've been gelling and, and whatnot. And then for Waterloo, they're going into their bye week now. And then coming off of that, they get Guelph at home, which I certainly uh, like I am all out of sorts on what I think about that game, much more so than I felt a week ago. They follow that one up. We'll go on the road to, to McMaster, which once again, by the time we get there, that's October 6th, which feels like a lifetime ago, though it's amazingly only like three, four weeks from now or, or mm-hmm. whatever, I, where I don't really know what to think about that. They get Toronto to round out their season. Oh, pardon me, with, with a game against Carlton in the mix there too. So, you know, some interesting opponents that they'll have coming off the bye, where, as you said, certainly some things that they can build off of from this week, from the season so far, like both, as we said, a lot of nice things we saw defensively against Windsor, a lot of nice things we saw offensively this week against Laurier, despite the outcome, going back to that Ottawa game in week one and, and everything like that. And obviously the York game being what it was. So I, I, I'm I, I, I'm curious to see how, to think of how they're kind of building off all those different things and with some interesting opponents they have in the second half of their schedule to to maybe pick up another win or, or maybe two. Who knows? I, I don't think playoffs, I, I, playoffs isn't the aspiration for this team, but I think there are a number of opportunities they have to keep building and learning about themselves, which I think has to be, if you're being honest with yourself, as a, a Waterloo Warrior coach, player, or fan, what this year is about. Any last commentary on this one, Tom? No, I think you you nailed it on the, on the head there. Um, just as a little aside, like you were kind of mentioning some of the the shakeup, I'm very happy that we're just doing a review this week because uh, of my thoughts of some of these teams has completely kind of changed after this week. But uh, yeah, I think you you completely nailed it, Waterloo. Uh, has some struggles, obviously, but we knew that going into this, Lori looks unbelievably good. Like, it's scary, and uh, I'm excited to see where this Golden Hawk team can go this year. Well, let's move into our, our next matchup, which will... It, man, oh man, I, I like set your timers here, set the over-under at four minutes. I mean, we almost set a new At The 55 record for longest podcast last week, um, <laughs> and... This one, I don't think will take very long. It was the Carlton Ravens putting up 52 to the York Lions 0 uh, at York Lions Stadium on Saturday. Where do we begin with this one? I mean, let's let's start with some numbers. Tristan Lefebvre, 17 of 22, 218, three touchdowns, one interception, bylaw number, blah, 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 states that we can give him his flowers for that performance. You got to love the efficiency. You got to love how he spread it around to a couple of his guys. Obviously, you know, the name of Kasim Ferdinand is, is I think, and I think we got to contact some of the people we know, some of the movers and shakers, and we still are not seeing his brother Denny in the mix. And I, I really want to see, want to know what his situation is because obviously the twin brother aspect of, of, uh, of, of that duo is so fascinating. And Denny, when we've seen him, in his OUA career, is a spectacular player as well. But I think Kasim Fernand is one of these guys that we obviously talk about a fair amount, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know how many conversations go on about OUA football that don't involve you and me in some capacity. I, I just hope there are conversations about Kasim Fernand happening uh, around the province right now because this is a special, special player. You know, five catches, 62 yards for 62 yards, and the one touchdown. 
But we've obviously seen week after week just the versatility he brings to that offense and how it allows them to unlock just such immense creativity. And then I feel like that allows other players to shine when he kind of becomes his focal point. And you always have to know where Fernand is on the field at all times. And I just feel like with some of the younger pieces we see on this team, I don't know Lefebvre's, Lefebvre's um eligibility. We know Ferguson's an older guy, but I feel like that can really be you know, just a special player that, I mean, he is a special player that this Carlton team, if not this year, may be looking next year when for the Ferdinands would be hitting that magical, I think year four period of like, wow, that could really be a time we see this team make a leap on the back of these two, hopefully these two brothers. What's some of your commentary, whether that's about what we've seen from Kasim this year or this Carlton team against York? Yeah, I really like what I've seen with Tristan Lefebvre. I I feel like he's been getting better and better as things kind of happen here. And once again, yes, competition, whatever. But, you know, the the big line that I like, and you already you called it out, is 17 for 22 on his attempts. Accurate attempts, making smart decisions with it. Obviously, he does throw that one interception. But still, I do like what I'm seeing from a quarterback standpoint from him. Um, You know, it's... It's tough to to find anything to talk about with these York Lions. I really want them to be doing well, but uh, 17 rushing yards, woof. Um, I'm more so just excited about this Carlton team. I think Corey Grant is starting to get into something of a groove here, and he's he's finding something of an identity for this team. You know, like we mentioned before, uh, when you're going up against York, you don't have to throw all of these special trick plays or whatever the case. So I think this is a little bit more of what we can expect from this Carlton team here kind of going forward. Lefebvre did a great job of spreading the ball out amongst uh, a, a few different receivers here. And Kasim Ferdinand, while being a very special player here, Hunter Brown, five mm-hmm. catches, 74 yards, and two touchdowns for them. That's pretty impressive. Now, I don't know if that was in garbage time or not because, like you said, it's very tough to watch that York stream when it's only two camera angles and it's tough to see who's catching and whatever else. But um, I think that this is a, a a really nice step for Carlton. I think this is, does a lot for their confidence even going into the season and understanding, hey, you know what, we can put up some numbers and we can shut out opponents and whatever else. So, um, yeah, that's, that's all I really got to say. <laughs> no, I, you know, we won't keep this any longer than it has to be, but you know, you bring up coach Grant's name and I think some of the commentary we are going to get into with our next matchup is about the connection between the era of a head coach and the players that are sort of theirs, if you will, in terms of when they came in and. Uh, I think a, uh, a comment that goes beyond just the the Matt Guelph game, as we'll talk about, but in some of these other teams where even when a coach has success in a program, there is just a point, and this is in all sports, and I'm sure any leadership position, when messaging grows a little stale. And I feel like with, with Corey Grant in there, some of these young pieces we're seeing, even if they weren't exactly coming in with Coach Grant, I, I just feel like a lot of this, this youth and kind of tying that in with Coach Grant being in his second year here is aligned really well where, you know, once again, I I do want to kind of talk to some of the people we know and see if we can, like, get a little in-depth look into this Carlton team as, like, there are some stories going on here that I want to know, even if it's not us having the, 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 the privilege to be able to tell them or kind of use our platform to let them tell those stories. I really feel like there's special things happening at Carlton right now where, Coach Grant's coming in with that energy he's bringing and and whatever the messaging is. And I just feel like this team's buying into it. And I, I just, I, I'm really excited about this team because it's coming off of, well, I guess what are we in? Is it year 10 now? I guess of, of coming in on 10 years since Carlton's been back. We it's see the 10 Im- years. Yeah. Cause they came year. back in 2013. And we obviously see year after year, the immense talent that goes through that program that then shows at the CFL level. I once made an offhand comment off mic, and I guess I'm just in the in the in the uh, process of now saying it on mic of being like, are they just a more talented York Lions, where like they get all this talent coming through their team that then goes to the CFL, but they just haven't put it all together. Obviously, that's a very unfair comment um, to the Carlton Ravens, but so many of those teams where it's like, how have they not gone on a playoff run? And for whatever reason, that has yet to happen. I just feel like 
I, I, I like the mojo I'm kind of feeling from this team. And with them being so far away, not being able to see in those games live, I don't know if I'll be able to get out to Panda, unfortunately, this year. I think we got to start just tuning in with some of the people we know who can perhaps put us in contact with, with the Carlton Ravens. Because I, I think there are some stories that people need to be knowing about. And I just, I, I, I'm excited for this team. I'm excited for this club. Yeah, a hundred percent agree with you. Love everything that Corey Grant has been doing. Um, I've spoken to a few folks. Obviously, he was at McMaster for a couple of, or a few, for a few years, and um, speaking with some of the players that I, you know, tail end kind of knew when I was finishing up slash coming back for some games. They had nothing but really great things to say about Coach Grant, and I think he's taken all of those talents and that mentality to Carlton, and we're going to see some. You know, we're, we've already seen, I think, a, a, an improvement over this year, over last year. And I think continuously as things continue to go on, they're only going to get better and better and better. And I think that uh, Coach Grant is, is going to do some special things there. Yeah, sure. it's it, it's tracking positively. And uh, I, as uh, the world's number one GG fan, I am having apprehension. Sweating, I, sweating bullets over there, I, eh? I am, oh, it is getting moist in here about where I'm going to go with that Panda game pick. Um, but luckily, we have a bit of time to mull that one over because next week, Carlton's going to be hosting the U of T Blues coming off of their buy. The York Lions will be hitting the road to take on the Guelph Griffins. And how about we talk about the Guelph Griffins because they're next on our list where they hit the road and for the first time in 18 years, is it? Since, since 2008. In 15 years, took out the McMaster Marauders, your McMaster Marauders, in Hamilton at Ron Joyce Stadium. Final score in this game, 21 to 13. Uh, we uh, we set up that there was a question that is relating to this game that we'll address. I'll start with my kind of broad commentary about this game because when we talked about on the preview pod for this one and we both said in our own way, I mean, I literally teased you when you kind of set up the, how does Guelph pick up the win on this one that like, Oh, and there's Tom picking Guelph against his Mirage at home. Uh, I mean, I did at some point say it's Mac by a, a sizable margin or whatever. So like, you know, <laughs> that eggs on my bald head. Um, but you know, in the commentary, we, we talked about, you know, if you're Mac, and, and, and I guess this does go into the question of how do they bounce back? So it's perhaps feeding two birds with one scone, if you will, where you have this game against Laurie coming up. You saw how they had a really less than spectacular showing week one against Windsor. We start throwing every red flag up in the air, sounding every alarm about what is going on with Mac football. And they're perhaps a pick six away one drive here or there away from taking out Western at home. Say what you want about where Western football is at right now. They're obviously still undefeated. They're obviously still the best until knocked off. Very impressive showing. And then going into this Guelph game, if you are Mac, do not look ahead to your next opponent, even though that's perhaps what at least I was doing. I'm just thinking about, oh my goodness, Keegan Hall versus Taylor (laughs) Elgersma. It's just like, put that on the marquee, put it in lights. And watching this game, Because I'm trying to remember who the individual was for Mac who had the punt return touchdown that got called back. And I I feel like it was during that during that moment. I think it was in the first half. And and just throughout the second half, even as Guelph was driving, even as they were scoring touchdowns, it just had this feeling of like, well, okay, Mac's just gonna turn it on at some point. They're just they're not worried about it. I'm not worried about it. They're, you know, from what we've seen this far thus far this year, they're the better opponent. They'll just you know, they'll turn on. And I kind of feel like that's what they were thinking of just, Hey, someone's going to make the play and we'll be good. And I don't want to go ahead and just assume that they were looking past Guelph. Cause as we talked about, especially with coach Batasic there, even if these players don't know about what the, the, the battle of highway six means, he certainly was there for those battles we had in the early 2010s. I can't imagine they were looking past Guelph, but it felt like they were. Tom, I've spoken way more than I should have given 
what you've been, the, the sort of mental scrutiny, whatever you want to be calling it, you've no doubt been dealing with uh, as, a, as a programming note. This was not why we had to push back <laughs> our podcast. It wasn't <laughs> to give Tom an extra day of reprieve or what have you. Um, as a programming note, we'll probably have to push back next week's pod as well, but we'll give you a reminder about that. Tom, the floor is yours. Take it in any which direction you so choose. Yeah, um, I completely agree with what you're saying here. It really, the vibe that I got even from watching this is that McMaster seemed cool, calm, and collected, thinking that, you know what, somebody's going to make a play here. We're going to be okay. And I think, you know, maybe that mentality from the defensive side may be warranted because that defense did play pretty well. I think Guelph ran a lot more than I was expecting that they'd be able to against that defense, certainly. And shout out to Donovan Malloy. He ran over a few marauders uh, in this game. He looked pretty impressive. Marshall McCray is a hell of an athlete as well. Um, so I don't want to take anything away from that Guelph rushing attack. Um, but the defense played decently well. Offensively, You've got some problems. Guelph showcased, hey, McMaster's going to an air raid offense. This is going to be really dangerous. They go 30 front and get consistent pressure sending three. Man, can you not have that? Because suddenly you've got three people rushing the quarterback, getting pressure with nine in the back end, defending five, six. Like, you, it, it, it cannot happen, guys. It cannot. And the style that they're playing, for anybody who was watching or, or noticed, the 30 front that's in there, the defensive ends are either head up on the tackles or inside of them, meaning that the linebackers on the outside are the ones who have contained. So those defensive ends can essentially tee off. They can do whatever they want to try to go after these, to go after Keegan Hall and to just make just eat McMaster O-line lunch money and that's exactly what they did and even shout out to Joshua Campbell as the nose tackle him and Curtis Woodman's he kind of flipped back and forth with that they got some consistent pressure up the middle as well and when you're an air raid offense who can't throw the ball and you're giving up pressure with three man fronts this is what happens you cannot do this as an offense the you've seen all the great stuff that Keegan Hall is capable of. You've seen the uh, targets that he has uh, available on the receiving core with Jackson Cooling, Jacob Patton. James Priestner still hasn't shown up, but if he comes back, he'll be another a great asset as well. But it comes down once again to that offensive line. It's the same. It's the same problem we were talking about last year. It's the same one going into this year. Thirty man pressure, three man pressure, getting to Keegan. It, it, you can't win football games that way. You just cannot. I, 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 this, I feel like I'm sitting in your chair watching me freak out about Guelph getting just <laughs> the break speed off them by Laurier last week. You know, I was, uh, our, our friend, Aaron Giesler, the executive director, uh, for football Ontario. I'm sure he's, he's listening. I'm not sure if he's, he's been watching, uh, in an email exchange, uh, just, you know, he, he said he's loving the content, but just asked to make sure that I, I don't call him a cardboard cutout on the air. <laughs> and I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to practice more patience and peace in my life and everything like that. But the, 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 the analogy, the metaphor is coming back. I didn't move all that, all that recently. I literally have those cardboard boxes sitting in the basement right now. I might have to start cutting out and, and, uh, oh. and hanging it in the backdrop here. You, you hit the nail on the head. Um, it's just, you know, it, and because when you look at what Keegan Hall did on the day, and those two interceptions were brutal, um, just, I mean, the timing, obviously, of the last one, kind of the proverbial nail in the coffin, um, and the one to Cromwell, I'm trying to remember how that one, I mean, how that one went down. I mean, Cromwell is a phenomenal player in his own right. I mean, no, no shame in that, that you're ever, but I mean, not that you're ever going to want to throw an interception, but 27 of 35, um, 257 yards. Um, and, but I feel like what speaks to the way that Guelph was able to kind of sit in their coverage is that it just felt like they were just, they weren't giving up anything big and they were just rallying to the ball and tackling really well, which, uh, you know, as we go back to it, like some of the guys that we saw out last week and perhaps even the week before, um, perhaps most prominently in Brandon uh, Farigo, Farigo um, being back there in the mix at linebacker is just 
it, and once again, that's why on the preview pod, you know, because we did have that question brought to us about like, what's the deal with Coach McPhee after what happened against Laurier? And, and you obviously raised it coming off of that game. And even after I, you know, was able to take out a chill pill and, and kind of look at the facts, yeah, you know what? Even if you're getting attacked through the air, having those types of losses in the box can have reciprocal effects. And the way they were able to kind of just play that shell defense over this McMaster team and just keep everything underneath clearly uh, paid dividends for them. Um, You know, the thing that I find was the most staggering and this very much, and I know I'm going to give Tristan Abood the shout out on this one, was the drive he led to get the go ahead touchdown in the fourth quarter. Like with what, like less than it was like less than three minutes in the game. Marches 75 yards in five plays to hit Vashon Janusis for the touchdown to put them up 21 to 13. And somehow, even at that point, and I'm looking here at the drive summary, a minute six left in the game when that had happened. I'm me still the 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 idiot I am being like, well, Max just still gonna get an eight point convert or an eight point <laughs> touchdown, and and then you know they'll still win it, right? I mean. You know, sh- shame on me, I suppose, wh- whatever you want to frame it. But that just, yeah, the 75 yards in five plays to get the game ceiling touchdown and coming off the back of the Horvat field goal to give Mac the lead back. But going back to that old problem of, you know, that's a 13 play drive Max put in together. And obviously this Guelph defense with some of those guys back in the fold, much more formidable than they were. But as much as we talk and, and as you highlight so um, adequately, the, the problems on offensive line, an issue going back to last year, the two issues going back to last year, the play of the offensive line and as perhaps a result or in addition to that, their inability to convert in the red zone. And obviously 31 yards is very much on the fringe red zone. But hey, in a game like this, like, you got to make something happen at that point. Um, should we should we talk more about Guelph at this point, Tom? <laughs> yes, I definitely want to get into what the Griffins were doing well because they did play a great game. Um, the only other thing that I I wanted to to kind of call out, and maybe this is I don't know if it was this was just me or if you got this vibe as well. Guelph seemed like they came into this game thinking that this is a playoff game. Like I, we need to come out here. We need to win. We like, there was some desperation in there. There was a few times that I saw on the McMaster side of the, the um, inside of the field, whether offensively or defensively guys who are, you know, they're not laying out for, to try to catch the, uh, the ball that Keegan throws. They're not really fighting for that extra yard defensively. There's a couple of missed tackles like Donovan Malloy, shout out to him. He did. He played absolutely fantastic, but there was a few times where McMaster defenders are in the backfield and they barely touch them. And it's like, it's, it's not a diving. Oh, I got to do whatever I can. It's a, Oh, I missed him here or there. And like, yeah, you know what? Normally I, I preface this by, oh, you know, I don't want to say this, whatever. No, I'm calling out McMaster here. It did not seem like you were playing desperate, like you wanted to win this game more than anything. It, se- it seemed like, hey, you know what? We're we're just going to come in here. We're going to find a way to do it because that's that's kind of what we do. You can't like it. You're not good enough to do that. Use that as bulletin board m- material. Please find a way to get inspired for the rest of this season here because – you are not playing the way that you're they're not playing to the caliber of player that they have on that team. It, well, and the comment about the uh, it being a, a playoff game in the Guelph Griffins eyes. I mean, you know, certainly coming off of last week, if you're Guelph, certainly the, the last two weeks, like you got to show some life. And in so many for so many reasons, this was like the worst case scenario based on the history, based on how good Mac was looking, based on the way that. Laurier sliced and diced at that secondary and how great that Keegan Hall was looking and how good that the the Mac defense was looking, even though, as we were saying, Guelph's offense was looking pretty feisty against Laurier, even with Isaiah Smith out and what Donovan Malloy, who, correct me if I'm wrong, I think, even though I think we mentioned it, Hamilton kid. I believe so. Which I believe so. Man, oh man, he must be on, on cloud 900 <laughs> after that one. And how good Tristan Abood is going. And though we've obviously teased Guelph, and I think for the right reasons about how 
specifically last year, the rotated quarterbacks, they clearly have, if this is going to be how they continue, where it's like, well, Boot is their quarterback, but then McCray's in for a very kind of quasi wild caddy kind of offense where it's like, and it's getting to a point too where it's like they run that almost Jalen Hurtsy kind of like just jam up the middle and he's just going to find his space in whichever gap it appears. Like it's they kind of can just run a QB sneak with him any point in the field, seemingly any down and distance. He's going to take the ball, let the O-line and the various receivers, tight end, fullback bodies that come in on that package just junk up the middle and trust his 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 vision as a ball carrier, his athleticism and, and just strength and speed and be able to say like, like it almost just feels like he can get like four to five pretty easily on that one. And and you know, the, the but the 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 kind of must win nature of it for Guelph, despite all these things kind of going seemingly against their way. Like we go back to that week one game where for Mac it's it, against Windsor and being like, shoot, when it's all said and done. This might be a game where your season hangs in the balance of it. And we've kind of we've clearly seen those teams establish themselves as different calibers of of squads, even though like I I don't know. I all right, let me just I'm kind of going all over the place. Let me try and focus this commentary with this question. And yes, like talk let's talk a little bit more about Guelph and I'll frame it like this. And the answer obviously could be C, both. But was this A, more impressive showing by Guelph, B, a disappointing showing by Mac, or the answer of which it most likely is a combination of the both? If I don't allow you to to take the quote-unquote cop-out answer of saying, well, yes, it's a bit of both, did you feel better about what Guelph did of saying like, hey, there's some things here. The injury bug is kind of passing through that offense. Donovan Malloy, Abu, Genesis, all these different things, what they do with McCray. Or is this like, my goodness, Mac is whatever. Or are we being, are we, are we going too far into the Mac attack here? No, I think I myself am very disappointed in this McMaster team because I'm a I'm a fan, I'm a former player, I'm an alumni, like that's that, that's me. If I'm looking at this and I'm, I'm watching all three phases, offense, defense and special teams, I'm more I think this story is more so Guelph did the things right rather than McMaster being disappointing well yes there was some things in there that obviously i just went on a little something of a rant about so there was a lot of things that were disappointing there you know the one thing that we haven't really called out i think the guelph special teams actually played really well they they had essentially like a blocked punt really early on in this game that got them into some great field position i think they were consistently doing some things to put them into solid positions nothing like off the charts by any means but they weren't losing that battle and i i think that mcmaster struggled with that a few times there and when you only lose by eight points one score is all it takes here you have to start looking at every single facet so i think the special team side of things they guelph also did a really good job in um Tristan Abood, for whatever you want to say about him, played solid enough. 18 for 24, 150 yards and a touchdown here. But more importantly, that offense has the perfect rhythm between when Abood comes in and when McCray comes in. Right now, I love the time that they're splitting with with the two of them and the situations that uh, Coach Shan is starting to do that with. I think uh, we certainly have seen the direct opposite of how you want a quarterback swap to play as we saw last year with how many times um we saw that happen but i think this year there's a pretty solid groove in play i'm still not completely sold on that griffin's offensive line but they did they did enough in order to sneak past a very good mcmaster defense so credit to them there and the defense itself while obviously having a ton of questions purely based off of the past couple of weeks Played really well this week. The defensive line stepped up and dominated when they should because they are better than that McMaster offensive line. And even like Jacob, uh, uh, just sorry, Javon Jacobson, this was his first game that he played in. He w- he got injured in training camp, and this is the first game that he comes out in, and this is what he does. If that team, specifically that defense, is fully healthy with a guy like Jacobson, Ferrigo, and Mortuzo, and then guys like Scott Murray, 
who has not played yet. Uh, Yusuf Khalidi, um, Josh Campbell, you've got Curtis Woodmansey, and then the defensive secondary plays fine or just good enough. Like this should be a top caliber defense within the OUA. And I think they showed some flashes of it in this game. So I really want to give a shout out to the Guelph Griffins here. And maybe I'm going to take a little bit of that with my awesome uh, pregame speech that I gave to them in the, uh, the preview <laughs> side of things. Uh, but yeah, they, they got the monkey off their back. There's no longer the Ron Joyce curse, as if you want to call it that, for these Guelph Griffins. They beat McMaster in Hamilton. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of season left, but at the very least, they've saved their season. They are now sitting at 500, correct me if I'm wrong. Yep. And, uh, yeah, like you, you have a fighting chance right now. Yeah. And in, you mentioned their names, but once again, Curtis Wood, Manzi, and Josh Campbell, two guys that, uh, you know, have kind of had that a bit of injury uh, trouble themselves. And obviously just, as you mentioned with them playing the 30 front that they did against this team and them able to just stick it in there down after down uh, was really impressive. I do kind of feel like the fate of both these teams, Tom um, is to just continue to torture you and I week after week though. Yep. I, you know, Maybe I should check my pulse from time to time. I'm like oddly apathetic about the team. Uh, I spent five years playing at and a number of years afterwards supporting in a number of endeavors in the post uh, laying era that we had there and whatnot. But, uh, you know, that's a whole other podcast in its own right. And for Mac, because this is the thing, like they go on to play Laurier in Waterloo next week. And am I going to pick them on the road? Spoiler alert. No. But am I going to pick them to have a, a better looking game than this one? I do think so. And for Guelph, they get a really nice little like this game was huge for Guelph because now they get this stretch where they host York and then they go on the road to Waterloo. And, you know, I was obviously saying with a good amount of bass in my voice that Waterloo was looking pretty solidly stronger than Guelph coming off of week uh, week three. And I don't know about that one at all. So this is a nice little roll they get before they get their bye week. And then they get, you know, a difficult end of the season with Queens and with uh, Carlton to wrap things up. But it's just, I, I feel like, you know, whatever level of investment that we have in these teams and for yourself, obviously having ties with both clubs, I just think that we are just going to be tortured by these two teams <laughs> for the rest of the season. And the last thing I'll say and whatever comments you have um, to make as well, you know, as it stands right now, um, like Max out of the playoff picture. And of course, we're four weeks into the season. Some teams have only played three games. Things are going to change. Guelph, like I said, some favorable games coming up. But could I see myself and this team be having a disappointing outing against one or one of those teams? Sure, totally. It's not York, but the Waterloo game still kind of, I'm curious about that one. And this just, as we talked about, the end of season um, tiebreak scenarios that we get from time to time, this could be one that we're going back to. As you said, Guelph treated it like a playoff game. Mac treated it like, a, hey, someone's going to make the play. We'll be fine. And uh, we obviously saw the fruits of that. Tom, last words on this game to you. Uh, well, I'm my last words, I'm going to specifically answer one of the questions that we had here, which was, can yes. you discuss how Mac bounces back after losing to Guelph? And right now, it, <laughs> this is as tough a position as you can put yourself in that these mar marauders have found themselves. So they're one in three, just to go a, into a bit of a deep dive for um, the McMaster Marauders, like you said, they play against Laurier next week. Then they go on the road again and they play against Toronto, which last year Toronto beat Mac to get into the playoffs. And in my opinion, a very similar kind of style that we saw today in terms of somebody's going to make a play. Somebody's going to step up and do something here. And nobody did, but Kinsale Phillips certainly did. So playing against a Toronto team week after their final home game against Waterloo, then they play against Ottawa in Ottawa, and the last week of the season they have as a bye. Now, best case scenario, absolute best, you run the table, you finish five and three, you kind of own your own destiny here. That is 
from what we've seen here, I think very unlikely. I think best case scenario, realistically, you go four and four, if not maybe three and five, and then you go into that week eight season or the last game and you're not playing and you purely have to rely on numbers and who's going to win here and and how everything else kind of works out. Like there's a very good chance they have lost their, their ability to own their own destiny this year already in week four because of what we've seen so far. Um, going into that comment a little bit more, and I won't say everything that was in there, but uh, Coach P's contract is up in 2024. And yes, he comes in in 2019. But what this comment says here is that uh, he won technically with Craig Knox's team. Those were guys that he recruited. Maybe the first year guys, because uh, P left in 2015. Maybe you've, you've got some of those fifth year guys who are uh, in that 19 season that you know you can kind of hang your hat on. But for the most part, that team is all uh, coached by Greg Knox. He Patasa comes in. He changes up the offense, specifically bringing in Todd Galloway and Corey Grant, and they go on a hell of a run and obviously win the Yates Cup and credit to that team. But since post-COVID, we have seen we have not seen the McMaster Marauders get into the playoffs. There's a lot of questions here and there's a lot of question marks around the program, the players that are there because recruiting I don't think is where it was certainly when you and I were playing here. Well, you play for Guelph, I me mean for McMaster, but you get what I'm saying. Um and there's there's just even the atmosphere of the team based on what me as a fan is seeing seems different this mcmaster team has a lot of things to kind of take a look at and there's a lot of things to clean up i think if you're mac you know players only meeting you do a gut check what do you want the rest of the season to look like how do you expect to finish this year are you going to finally make it back into the playoffs which I can't believe we're talking about a McMaster Marauder team that's struggling for the third year in a row to potentially make the playoffs. And are you just going to sit back and, you know, it is what it is. Somebody's going to make the big play and we'll, we'll try to work the rest of this season out here. I think you have to get more diverse on that offense. You cannot just rely on Keegan Hall right now because he doesn't have the blocking in front of them to keep him clean so that he can consistently find targets. If more teams start adopting what Guelph just did against them in terms of 30 fronts and putting nine guys back, you know, yes, he throws a couple of picks, but there's nine guys compared to his five or six. Like there's only so much that you can do as a receiver to try to get open there. There's three extra bodies in there to try to help cover. So there's a lot of problems here. And I think the majority of them, if not all of them lay in the offense, you need to establish a run game or just change something up so that you don't have defensive linemen teeing off to get to Keegan hall. And you don't have defensive backs and linebackers just waiting to pick a ball off here. You have to change up something on the offense. That defense is good enough. Scott Brady. I have total faith in he's going to be able to change things up week after week in order to remain competitive here. But offensively, you have to find a way to win here. You, offense, are holding back this McMaster team from winning the games that they should be. I I, I might have to just clip that. That was beautiful. That was eloquent. That was to the point. It was harsh but fair. Harsh but fair. Uh, I will steal last word, though, because in talking about Western and trying to win the 3-8s Cups, we were, of course, corrected. Uh, I need to give a shout out to Ken Waller. Uh, shout out mm. to you, Ken Waller, as always, for, of course, and this is going back to your commentary of pointing out that, you know, 20 some years ago, Mac won the four in a row in the early 2000s there. Um, and just talking about the history of this team and just, you know, if you're if you're new to the game, if you're new to the, the history of this game, um, just what that true, all those things you said and why that is more meaningful than it could than it is for other programs it's it's things like that so uh what that's going to look like in the next coming weeks uh you know we'll see um also you know quick shot can can i believe you're a teacher or a retired teacher you know 
showing his stripes because I, I used the term Sisyphean on the last podcast. Yes. But I said Sisyphusian, obviously the the character of Sisyphus. I added the extra syllable. And, you know, in such a, a, a teacherly manner, he could have been like, look at this idiot, mispronounced it, meant to say this. <laughs> he just slipped in the correction, Sisyphean, not Sisyphusian, and just shout out to Ken Waller. Let's go to our next matchup. Take us all the way to the nation's capital where the Windsor Lancers, after, you know, after much deliberation on our part to figure out how long a bus ride takes from Windsor to Ottawa, they (laughs) hopped on that ride and picked up the W against the Ottawa GGs. Final score in this one, Windsor 42, Ottawa 31. Tom, if there's, if there's certainly one commentary I want to make off the jump, it's that in the last two years, I don't know if there's a matchup we get that's better than Windsor and Ottawa facing off. Mm. We've talked about how exciting that opening week game was. They played last year in Windsor. Obviously, that quarterfinal game in Ottawa last year, game of the year, I, I think, unless there's something I'm missing um, in that calculus. And this one despite looking a little lopsided off the jump, turned into a a really exciting affair in the third quarter when Ottawa put together a 15-3 third quarter to bring themselves within within, uh, punching range of this team. The one thing I'll say before getting your thoughts on this, though, you know, obviously, I, I I adore this Gigi's team. I really love what they've done for the last number of years, and for good reason. What they were building with with Miracle at the helm, obviously with James Peter, with JP Simon Kinda, all these various skill position. Our guy Daniel Oladejo and a ton of these guys that are still on the team. Almakar Polk leading the the province and rushing and by a good margin. And I I thought that after Miracle going down. So early in that game, week one against Waterloo in, you know, Aaron Rodgers-esque fashion, it happened so early. Lacandro getting those two starts, or pardon me, I guess those one full start against UFT and pretty much a whole game against Waterloo, but then getting your bye week that obviously this is a tough opponent. And I literally, after saying I was picking Ottawa right away, I'm like, oh my God, but it's Windsor. You know, this Windsor team's amazing. And <laughs> I picked against them against Mac and obviously saw what happened on that one. But I just felt that this was a player who I liked from the going back to his time at Queens. He's now, you know, at the helm here. It's his team. And the bye week, bring it all together. And with all the other pieces I like about this team, yeah, I'll take them at home against perhaps the best team in the OUA. Lacandro goes 8 for 20, 144, no touchdowns, and two interceptions. The best pass thrown by a Gigi's player was Matt Mahler, who is now listed as athlete slash receiver. He used to be Ben Miracle's backup, but one of the trickeries they did to kind of get their mojo going was Lacandro to Mahler deep down the field to, I believe it was Jean Tron for that touchdown. And I'm not saying I'm giving up complete hope in the GGs just because Amlakar Polk is still such an immaculate talent. And this might go down as Lacandro's worst game and perhaps even by a margin. It's just, it. it's certainly tinting my confidence in this team after all those things we said, him getting essentially two full games and the bye week with this offense that he comes out and puts up a bad performance against, albeit a top three team in the province. What were your thoughts watching this one? Well, uh, first off, I was so pleased to see the cornucopia of points that were scored in this one. Shout out, Mr. Ken Waller. Uh, yeah, the uh, this Windsor team while there's still a lot of questions and that you and I uh, kind of have, and I think we'll, we'll get into a little bit of this uh, later on during here. The one thing that I want to call out here, there's one constant that every championship level program is able to do week after week after week. And it's capitalize on your opponent's mistakes. That second quarter for Ottawa 
was a rough one. They did not do a lot of things really well. And every time something happened, Windsor was there to capitalize on it. They they threw an interception, I believe, and Windsor scored off of it. They they were able to come up with a big stop and Windsor scored off of it. Like they capitalized on the areas of opportunity that they had. They didn't leave any points on the on the board. And that's what the great teams do. You know, there's certainly some question marks in terms of the penalties that this team has another 12 penalties in this game. And that like you can't continuously keep doing that and expect to be continu- uh, consistently cons- uh, uh, successful. Excuse me. But yeah, there's a lot of things going on with this Windsor team that I love to see and capitalizing on mistakes is so important in order to be in that upper echelon here. Ottawa, like. You know, and I it's it's tough because I don't want to throw st- too much shade at Ryan Lacandro here. You are not the same caliber of offense specifically without Ben Miracle. The pieces in play that are there are great pieces, don't get me wrong. And Amalcar Polk is certainly putting together a case of why he should be the OUA MVP. I don't want to take anything away from him, but like you see those amazing receivers that Ottawa has, and they're tr- they're going backwards off of their routes, trying to catch balls that are improperly thrown. There's certain balls that are overthrown, and like this, uh, Lacandro does not look like he's got, you know, the, the real solid chemistry that you need with your receiving core here. It looks like they're still throwing in like training camp or even spring practice for the first time, like. It, 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 the chemistry is not there for these folks, and it's a shame because Ottawa, like you've said for a number of years, has some really fantastic skill players. And like to, and much like you uh, said, I don't want to lay all this at the feet of Lacandro because obviously they still have they still have great skill talent there, but they lost a ton of skill talent. Um, to, worth noting, but like I, it just I think about you know the Eric Cumberbatch interception. Perhaps the one mistake Danny Skelton made late in the game. And, you know, I mean, man, oh, man, it's one of those things where, like, sorry, Eric, you got to make one more juke and take that one to the house because you set up Lacandro inside the 15, was it? And they have to settle for three. Also, some weird offensive decisions by the GGs late in that game when they decided to go for it or not go for it that was mystifying both the announcers, myself, and I'm sure a number of other people tuning in. But, you know, I don't want to lay us all the fee at Lacandro. But another thing that I've loved about this team for so long is just the defenses they've put together. And I, I don't have a full list of the guys we saw go down, but it's certainly... Uh, is is not going to instill confidence going forward, depending on the status. And number one, of course, is our guy Harner Dollywall going down, and, and, and it looked pretty nasty. Um, I believe because Eric Cumberbatch got the interception. I think it was then Patrick or Cumberbatch who might have got injured as well, or was it Crookshank? I'm I'm trying to remember another one of those DBs who got banged up. I even feel like Kevin Victome at one point was a little wobbly coming off of a hit or a tackle or something like that. And like in specific, like the secondaries this team's put together, um, going back to the you know um, days of uh, uh, what was his name? A uh, Harry, Harry. Ah, uh, goodness gracious. Uh, it was their corner for a couple of years. And of course they had, they just had an incredible secondaries. I should have prepped this a little bit better uh, before just diving into that one. Maybe I'll do some Googling when you're next, uh, uh, when, on your next comments there. Um, but that's really the big thing where I was, you know, with the run game and how good these defenses have, have consistently been, um, you know, they've been able to piece it together. But, you know, as I said, that Eric Cumberbatch pick, perhaps one of the only mistakes that Danny Skelton made on the day, because otherwise he's 24 for 32, 286, two touchdowns, and the one interception. You know, we talk about mistakes, pass interference on Ottawa, sets them up on the one to give Christopher John the one-year di- one yard dive to, to put it in there. But, uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about quarterback rankings, but, you know, Skelton is making a case for himself when we talk about possible MVP dark horse MVP candidates the way this team is trajecting that yeah he is in that conversation for sure if or at the very least as far as top quarterbacks in this league most definitely um I loved everything that I've been seeing from this kid and we've said that a couple of weeks now um the one thing I wanted to to call out it wasn't uh I don't think it was an interception that I was thinking of it was a block punt that 
uh, Windsor was able to no, it wasn't even blocked. It just went through the um, yeah Campbell uh, Fair, yeah, yeah Campbell Fair's hands. It was just a little Brutal. bit high, and he didn't have it. Um, and the, then they recover and they they get a quick score off of that. But regardless, Danny Skelton has looked really good. Um, Joey Zorn, Christopher John, um, you know, obviously we we said everything that we had last year about uh, Joey Zorn and all of the amazing things that he's continued to do this year. But man, Christopher John, I know he finishes this game with 12 attempts for 42 yards, but like making guys miss at the size that he is and being able to do the things. One of my favorite plays that I saw from him, I think it was his, his long of, of 10 yards. He makes a few guys miss going through the hole and runs up and then kind of like hurdles slash jumps over a guy as, as he's tackling him. And another Ottawa G defender is coming at him. And despite Christopher John being in the air, hits the Ottawa defender and blows him backwards because of yes. just the force that that this guy's running the ball with even despite being in the air not being able to pump his feet um like the the run the rushing attack is so impressive that regardless of you know you're looking at Danny Skelton you're looking at some of the numbers and this some of the things that he's been doing it's great don't get me wrong you should respect it like you can't afford not to account for the run first there's Joey Zorn Christopher John and even Mumbo like the three of them are doing some really great things here. And like he, it's insane how many weapons they have on offense. Now, the one thing that I am a little nervous for, and the one thing that I do want to call out right now, the biggest um, opportunity, let's say for defenses to really capitalize with this auto or sorry, with this Windsor offense is that right tackle for Windsor. I don't want to call out his name because the only time that offensive linemen normally have their names called out is when they're holding or offside or something along those lines. So I'm going to leave him out. But the right tackle for Windsor struggled a little bit against this Ottawa GG's team. And that defense is is very good. Don't get me wrong here. But um, that's certainly something that I believe a lot of teams are going to be circling as, hey, this is somebody that I think we can kind of get after here. So that makes me a little nervous, but the other 11 players on the field for, for Windsor's offense looks really impressive. And, and, you know, if that is where teams can find their advantages against uh, Windsor, they're, you know, they still have two of the best pass rushing teams in uh, Queens and Laurie on their schedule. I mean, as we talked about it on last week's pod, they themselves, I think, are deserving of the title of best pass rushing team in. And oh yeah, guess what? Kaladi uh, Amusin with another sack on the on the day. Um, as a quick aside, Jamie Harry was the name I was trying to think of. Got it. Uh, back from those late twenty tens GG's teams, who was just such such a force there, a corner for them. Um, but you know, obviously, Skelton's numbers and everything he's he's, he's putting up doesn't come without. You know, we talk about how. Um, you know, some of these other top quarterbacks we're seeing around the league and how they're spreading it out. And, you know, it, we obviously talk about the STM connection of, of Hillock to Magnate Jones, but obviously Hillock's been, you know, finding guys like Motion uh, Jamal and, and some of his other targets. And, you know, Zorn's, uh, pardon me, Skelton's doing such a great job of that, but just a couple guys that have really, in the last two weeks in specific, and this week obviously being the most recent of them, in Shane Johnson and Javoni Cunningham. And, you know, Johnson was the guy in that Waterloo game where Water, as we as I said on, on the broadcast and on our commentary, aside from a couple big hitters that uh, the skeleton was able to get, Waterloo was just saying you can take everything underneath you want, and I, Johnson must have got at least nine or ten catches in that game on just like all right, hit seven, eight yards and just turn it around. The ball's going to be out of my hands and right into yours. And he gets not as uh, six catches again in this one for ninety five yards. Javoni with seven catches as well. Guys like Daniel Thrasher, Colby Ginn, Justin Omoa as a guy that was perhaps the the player with the most uh, name brand recognition coming into this season mm -hmm. um, and perhaps being the lesser of some of those other names we talked about now. It's all been said and done. And just one of the things that you know, we've kind of had this commentary about some of the other teams and, and just you know worth kind of throwing the flowers towards this Windsor offense now where it's like it's – we talked about how deadly it is when you have Zorn, you have John, you have Mambo throwing a couple of of sweeps, a couple of pitches to a guy in Liam Talbot, who's obviously a star returner for them. But just it's getting to the point where 
you just look at the way that this offense can move the ball spread out in so many ways and attack you in so many different ways. And to your point about Christopher John, where it's like the book is clearly out on like, he's going to try and run you over, but he's kind of now playing that next level of chess of being like, well, when you drop your ass to the ground to try and go through my legs, I'm going to give you a quick side juke and make you look silly. Um, and yes, of course, the play you were talking about came immediately to mind as he helicoptered through the air and knocked an auto <laughs> defender on his keister. But, you know, just just more evidence to why this Windsor team is is looking so formidable. The 12 penalties, though, I still don't love. And that's that's one of the things that I just still feel like with this Windsor team as far as like it, whatever that extra bit of trust is and you know this was a game where obviously I very much thought and it like Ottawa could have taken this game no doubt I mean like it was there for the taking at moments um but with Windsor and 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 this this latter part of the season is going to be so crucial not just for how the end of the year standings shake out not just for how individual wards kind of the cases for players in the individual wards category shake out and things like that but really just you know sort of teams testing their metal that classic iron sharpening iron um you know hackneyed metaphor or what have you cuz like let's look ahead next week they're hosting queens then they got Western, and then after their bye week, they get. Oh wait, hold on. They're on the road at Laurier. You know, like add Ottawa into the mix of that, and we obviously highlighted this going into the season. And I think partly why we put them in that C tier of just being like they're good. They were good last year, but like against some of these teams they're playing this year, and maybe that isn't really to the true nature of the tiers of being like whatever. But like you might still end up at four and four you know, because of who you're playing. And obviously we saw Matt could have stolen that game against them week one um, and what have you. So, you know, this will be such a a, a a fascinating end of the season for the Lancers because it'll not only tell us so much about who they are, but obviously, and we'll get into the final two teams, our two A-team, A-tier teams uh, briefly, but just about who these other teams are because the Windsor is a fascinating litmus test by which you can judge the various components of your own team. Most definitely. And I, I think that was beautifully said. So well done to you, sir. Um, <laughs> Sometimes the words work. Sometimes yeah. they work. You, you, you own that uh, title of wordsmith, my friend. Um, <laughs> yeah, I am. I am very interested in this, in this Windsor team. And while I don't want to take anything away from them in terms of how impressive they look, because they have looked very impressive. Like you kind of pointed out, like, some of the uh some of the teams that they have played so far there's there's a case in there that you could say well are you really playing against the upper tier of the OUA and Ottawa kind of showcasing some things now i still think that Ottawa is a top 5 team for sure but you play against McMaster and i am completely all over the place with where i think Mac is let's just say that and keep that civil then you you go out <laughs> And you you keep you play against Guelph and you you do your thing against Guelph and you do it well. Then you go out and you play against Waterloo and you do your thing against Waterloo and that team's a lot better than the thirty-seven to nothing score. But it's there, you are the better team in that scenario. And then you go up and you play against Ottawa here and Ottawa certainly from the offensive side of things does not have the showing that they want to. Yeah, this next. This next few weeks, especially the next two, is going to be very telling with where Windsor sits in the hierarchy of the OUA. We've been saying about them for, you know, since pretty much week two, we think this Windsor Lancer team is legit. And I still believe that. I still think that they are. Um, I don't think that they, they're they 4-0 on accident. I think that they, they do own that title. But whatever you do against Queens and whatever you do against Western, that will finally put you, people will know if you are legit or not. And not only just if you win that game or whatever, even if you lose those games, but if you do it close and if you're fighting the entire time and you're making sure that you're not taking stupid mistakes, i.e. 12 penalties in a game, I think you have a very real 
opportunity here to shock the rest of the OUA and to go on a very serious playoff run and potentially go into a Yates Cup for the first time in I can't remember how long. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that this Windsor team has like all of the upside in the world, but it's going to it's we're getting into put up a shut up time ha- now where you need to continue what you've been doing and the dominance that you've been showcasing. And I want to make it very clear. I do believe that they have the capabilities to do it. But, you know, we talked to I talked about it previously with some other teams. Coulda, woulda, shoulda. Let's see if you actually do or don't for this Ottawa team. <sighs> Man, um, that offense needs to be better. Ryan Lecandro, while I don't want to put this entire thing on you, because certainly there's a lot of other factors that go into here, there needs to be more chemistry between yourself and the receivers that you have here. My goodness, we know that the receivers that are there are really special. Gendron in particular, I think he's a fantastic outlet for um, for Lecandro if he can continuously find him on a consistent basis here. And that defense, I think, showcases the capabilities to be really great. You got to put it all together. And we are rapidly coming to the end of the OUA season already. It's we're already halfway through it essentially here. Like there, you are running out of time to showcase that you can do this. So GG's get on your horses here and get going. Yeah. And well, to, to the, to the Windsor piece, you know, can to shock the OUA. I mean, I, I don't know. I think that a great piece of, um, wisdom that I remember Stu Lang sharing with me. I was actually our unsung hero award winner in my first year at Guelph. And I remember sitting down with him in his office. He wanted to talk to me after because he had brought that in. He had won that award himself when he was playing with the Edmonton Elks um, during his time with them in the CFL. And he said this piece of, you can only be unsung once. Mm-hmm. And we have now been singing this Windsor song going into last year as well. So I think they're certainly on people's radars. And, you know, though we never like to take shots at anyone, this isn't a shot. It's just the cold truth of the game of football. Ryan Lacandro, you are the quarterback. And it's certainly not Amalcar Polk that's holding this team back. It's certainly not that defense. And if I may, as a last word on this, and we'll take a quick look at the schedule for Ottawa before moving on, that front four of theirs had a phenomenal game. Mm -hmm. We know how good this running attack is for the Windsor Lancers. Though, as you pointed out, perhaps... Uh, there are some areas you can attack that offensive line on. On the whole, that is a big, fearsome offensive line with one of the better O-line coaches in the province and a guy who's been doing it as long, if not longer, than than many people. I thought that was a incredible showing from their run defense in limiting what Windsor could do. And obviously, Skelton just picked up the pieces for them to be able to put them in positions in addition to capitalizing on those GG mistakes. So... You know what? Oh man, that that really was, it was it was a stellar game. It was immensely entertaining. Um, whenever you see these two teams on the schedule, you got to tune in. They have the proof is in the pudding mm-hmm. of uh, of what happens when these two teams do battle. But of course, as you said, this OUA season is going fast, and we went through what Windsor has coming up, where they're hosting Queens next week, and for Ottawa, they're hitting the road to take on the Windsor Lancers, and it just. We mentioned this going into this week, but it's it's this stretch of games that becomes such a beautiful microcosm and a, a beautiful cr- sort of cross section of how we can compare these teams. Because of course, this takes us beautifully into our last game of Week Four, where the Western Mustangs went into Queens and picked up a nail biter of a of a victory against the Queens Golden Gales at New Richardson Stadium. Final score in this game, the Western Mustangs 32, Queens 27. If you didn't catch this one, let us do you the favor of starting at the finish because, of course, the ending was one for the books when the STM connection was <laughs> as as sharp as it's ever been with Savon Magne Jones hauling in a 55-yard pass from Evan Hillock. It's as if he planned it. You know, Evan's <laughs> our guy snapping the ball there at the 55, slinging it up there for Savon Magne Jones to put them ahead 32 27 with 13 seconds left on the clock. And the rest is history, as they say. It, quickly, let's, or however long it takes, let, let's stay on that topic, though, because Queens pulled ahead 
within the last minute themselves. They get a Russell Weir one-yard touchdown with 57 seconds left in the game to go up 27 to 25. And a comment was passed along to us via a conversation you were having with another OUA uh, pundit, another OUA fan, in that, well, if you're Queens, so you get the touchdown to go up 26-25. If you go, by getting the, the, the one point, you're up for two, a field goal wins it for Western. So in, in essence, only being up one still makes you vulnerable to defeat by a field goal. If you go for two, you might force Western or you might change the way Western, excuse me, you might change the way that you play defense as a whole in terms of, well, we can't let Western get into field goal territory because field goal wins it. And all of a sudden, maybe that Hail Mary doesn't end up happening. I I, I feel like I bumbled through that a little mm-hmm. bit. Tom, your thoughts on that or perhaps reiterating the point of just what the individual, I mean, if they wanted us to name them, go ahead and name them. I know they it was through a conversation you were having. But I thought that was interesting, though ultimately, I, I well, I'll, I'll respond to whatever you have to say about that first. Yeah. Um, well, I don't think that they have any issue with it. The individual is our guy, Mad Jack Moore. Um, he and I text quite a bit talking about OUA football in general, as we're both just fans of the game. And he obviously he does an absolutely outstanding job being a uh, the play-by-play commentator for Laurier football. Um, but yeah, he brought up an interesting point there because when you're in that situation, you're up by two points you now have to really defend well, like either a field goal or a touchdown, obviously, and you win the game. If you go for two and you get it, you're up by three. And then that way, even if you force Western into a field goal and they make it, it's still a tie game. You go to overtime, you still have a chance to win. If you don't get it, you're only down by one point. And yes, in the Canadian game, it can be a little bit difficult because like you have the Rouge and you could potentially tie that up as well. But at the end of the day, you're not really that far back rather than just being up two points here. If you're up three points, suddenly you can really defend against the big play and you can keep everything up in front of you and force them almost into that, okay, you have to go for a field goal here and give yourself a chance to win it in overtime or even block the field goal. But when you're only up by two, you have to honor everything that they're that Western is doing here because either a field goal or a touchdown can win it. And now suddenly you're playing a little bit more of a standard defense rather than almost cheating a bit and staying back and forcing that. And obviously, um, Savon Magny Jones and Evan Hillock find each other. And shout out to uh, our guy in Deshaun Stevens, Persevere. Zach, I don't know if you've seen this, but he pulls the radio coverage that Queens has, and the color guy just starts screaming, No, oh no, as <laughs> Savon Maggie Jones runs into the end that's zone. Amazing. It's it's you can hear the heartbreak in his voice, and that's what really makes football and sports so amazing when people yeah. care like that but um yeah i think there's definitely a point in there where i don't think it really matters all that much if you if you don't get it on that two-point conversion but if you do i think it changes the way that ryan bickman is calls that game with a minute left to go it's no it's certainly it's a worthy point to discuss there's just part of me that feels like you know because i'm trying to think so they they score the touchdown they convert there's 13 seconds left so you know 55 yard bomb Magne uh, Jones had to run in a good chunk of it. I'm trying to pull up just exactly what time was on the clock when, you know, Hillock took the snap there. But, you know, though he didn't have um, one of his best games. Oh, no, sorry, he is perfectly fine. Garrett, he goes three for four, three for three on the extra points. Um, you, you have a guy who's one of the better kickers in the league. Obviously, as we know about Richardson Stadium, New Richardson Stadium, the win can be a bit fickle at times and, and create difficulty. And, and maybe that was playing in to Queens's favor. Um, and I feel like, where is it right here? Um, I don't have the time here, on, but when the pass happened, I just feel like you're at midfield with, I don't know, let's say around call it 20 seconds, call it 20 seconds. I mean, first and foremost, like I, no matter how they're playing up that defense, it, changing up that defense, w- even if they were defending more of the middle of the field, you know, 
Magna A. Jones being able to get behind whichever corner that was for Queen certainly wasn't in the books for how McManus drew it up. Whether or not, obviously, it might have been more of a true prevent in the event they were up by the three and would concede giving up the field goal and say, hey, let's take these guys to overtime. And I still don't know how I feel about that as your your, your sort of mentality as a team if you're going to say, I mean, obviously, let's not give up the big bomb, but sure, let's let them tie it up. I still feel like you're playing to say, no, let's let's shut the door on these guys right here and now. Um, but I also just feel like if you're at the 55, you got maybe 20 seconds left. Don't know the timeout situation, but I, just, I feel like Hillock could have got them into field goal range from there. Um, nonetheless so i mean it's 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 a beautiful debate conversation to be able to have um i i hope one day in the near future you jack and i are sitting around a beer having a conversation about that and many other topics about (laughs) what made this season so spectacular but let's talk about some of the other things that made this game spectacular and let's go to the queen's side of the ball because you know we did see the return of Anthony Souls in the backfield for Queens and he gets 15 carries for 66 yards and a touchdown. And it's obviously going to be a huge aspect of where Queens can really take their team. We talked about maybe this wasn't going to be the game that Vreekin kind of had his his coming out party in the 23 season. He goes 26 for 45, one touchdown, two interceptions, of course, one of those becoming uh or coming back all the way for six. Um on the whole, I felt pretty good about his performance. But, you know, what I thought was so impressive by Western ultimately going back to this run game for Queens is that we saw, I, I think it was in the fourth quarter, might have been late third, when Max von Muldorfer, their big nose tackle in the middle of that uh, Western defensive line, goes out with an injury. And I kind of love how Queens right away was just like, okay. We are going to run it straight at you. And we've talked about how great this linebacking core is for Western in the in the likes of Riley McLeod and Max Nixon and, and uh, Lorenz Bowers-Kane. But when you lose your star nose tackle and you have the caliber of running backs the Queens have, I love the way they attacked. But on the whole, I thought it was a great job by Western to rally around that that loss of a player and I don't know that his full status in being able to still mitigate what could have been disastrous against the team in Queens that can run the ball with the best of them out there what are some of the other thoughts you had about this game yeah um I was interested in how much they went to freak in with uh with the play calling here the, you know the other thing to to call, to call out here yes uh when you look at total offense Queens finishes with 100 more yards than Western does. They finish with 506 compared to Western's 403. The real thing that I wanted to point out, though, total offensive plays. Western finishes with 54. Queens with 73. Dang. That is a considerable more amount of offensive plays. Despite the time of possession, I guess um, Queens has it for 33 minutes and 52 uh, 3352 and Western has it for 2609. So obviously you really own the uh um the time of possession here, which I thought was really interesting because like Anthony Souls, 15, 15 rushes, 66 yards, Derek Asari, seven rushes, 54 yards, Alex Vreekin himself, four rushes for 36 yards. So they obviously are doing some stuff on the ground, but typically you find it's more of the offensive or the run heavy teams that are owning the clock like that. And Alex Vreekin, like you said, 26 for 45. 45 passing attempts in a single game is a very big mark, especially the fact that Alex Vreekin is what? 19 20 years old like he's only a second year player so that's that's a whole hell of a lot to put on this kid now he does do well 358 total yards and a touchdown but two picks one of them obviously like you said being that pick six here so interested that they were really focusing on Vreekin. now he is the future of that program certainly from a quarterback standpoint he's he's coming in for james keenan who obviously you know had his own injuries last week or sorry last year and Vreekin came in and he did a pretty good job of that so they want to continue that progress here but even if you're not seeing everything you want to see on the ground i still think that you're doing something like you know um, I saw a lot of power uh, run plays from from Queens and pulling guards in that and uh, very Tom Flaxman slash Western-esque in that regard. 
but like let's get some toss plays let's try to get to the outside let's do something a little bit more here rather than completely relying on Vreekin to try to take over this game nothing nothing against the kid I don't know if he's there yet to go up against a western Mustang team throw for 45 times and take over a game yeah well you know and I mean they, they have their little pin and pull action there with the two guards going out um to the outside um you're you're right. I mean, I, I didn't go back to rewatch this game. Um uh, but you know, it's interesting where, you know, going back to having a guy like Souls in the mix, how you know, he gets the three catches as well. I mean, we we've talked about kind of the three known receivers or or or, or best known receivers in in Falcone, O'Neal, and then Quemo, and just that added element that I guess Souls adds, not just in the running game, but allowing them to spread out. And what'll be kind of what I'm so curious now to look forward to going. Um, and you know, we, we've gone long enough without really talking about Evan Hillock and Keon Edwards <laughs> and what they did this game. Um, but uh, and, and you know, styles make fights, and sometimes your offense is a, a reflection of how the defense is trying to play you and. There's certainly teams that just say that, you know, by hell or high water, we're going to do it our way no matter what you put in front of us. But I, I I wouldn't have taken this team to be one that just kind of chunks it down the field. We've perhaps overly, uh, we've used a bit overly the idea of death by a thousand cuts because um, that kind of looks like what Queens tried to do in this one and whether that's a reflection of who they or how they identify as an offense or what Western was trying to do to them is something obviously with Queens already having the buy and one less game of, of information and Anthony soldiers coming back. I'm, I'm super curious to see, but let's talk about your guy, our guy, your guy, my guy, everyone's guy, uh, Evan Hillock, um, you know, 17 for 27, 273, two touchdowns, the one interception, you know, not as efficient as we've come to see him be, but it's kind of like the commentary about Western in general, that even when as a team, they come down to earth a little bit, it's like, yeah, but you know, they've been, they've been orbiting the moon. So now they're in kind of the <laughs> yeah. you know stratosphere or whichever the spheres you feel like they're in. And, and if this is a uh, quote unquote, um, a more human, more achievable, uh, type of performance by Hillock that other quarterbacks can look around the league and be like, Hey, you know, I could probably do that. It's like, cool. All right. We'll just, just, just wait till every other game that he has there. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, Keon busts out as well for 133 on the ground with a long of 55 as well. It was, a, it was a day of 55s all across the province, Love but it. you know, just the performance of his offense. We, we obviously talked about the, 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 uh, the, the magistry of that final play and how exciting that was. But you know, what did you think about the way that Western was moving the ball against this Queens defense, as we've talked about, one of the better pass rushing teams in the league, one of the better defenses in general. With, you know, you mentioned Beck Mass's name and some of those names in the secondary and how great uh, and how great they are. Yeah, certainly. I think in this game particularly, Evan was uh, had a lot more pressure that he had to deal with rather than any other team that I think he's played against so far. And like I said before, I love his ability to move in the pocket specifically. He steps up with confidence. He's able to find, I don't think he really panics all that much. He did take off and run a, a couple of times there. And I believe he was, well, he definitely was sacked uh, a couple of times as well. But I don't think, like, I really just, I can't say enough great things about this kid. I think that he takes over the game whenever he kind of needs to. Um, there was a few times where, you know, the <laughs> it's hilarious because I would say that Western really struggled to get the run going, and Edwards still finishes with, a, with 133 yards, which is hilarious to me. Um, but Evan Hillock is just really showcasing why, in my opinion, he is the top tier of quarterbacks that are playing in the OUA right now. He's poised in the, in the pocket, finding his receivers, throwing guys open, which is a term that if, if not everybody's kind of savvy to, like the idea of like, you've got a receiver who's doing a fly route, running straight up the field, and you can kind of throw it either way, but he throws it to the outside away from the defender. So it forces the receiver to get open in a spot or just place it in a spot where only his receiver can get it. And I've seen more often than not those types of throws rather than just throwing to a general area and the receiver coming up with a great catch. Now, 
also you've got guys like Seth Robertson, Savon Magny, Jones, Moss, and Jamal who are able to make those great catches if you need to. But I think the quarterback play specifically that we've been seeing from Hillock here has really been outstanding and is why a big part of the reason why at, at least this Western team is still undefeated. Yeah, I, I, and I think it was in the second quarter because I'm just looking at the the Garrity field goals because I think ultimately Western had to settle for a field goal, but there was a drive where, you know, on your TV screen, Western was going left to right, and it, 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 their first down in somewhere in Queen's territory, obviously in field goal range, and Hillock tries to hit. I, I'm trying to remember. It was, I believe, either Robertson or or Jamal on a corner route to to his right, his being Hillocks. And I believe they had Miller Melanson on the coverage. And then you could see on the very next play, they motion a guy over, brings the safety towards, uh, you know, to Evans' left to kind of give him this true one-on-one coverage. And they run another corner route. And it falls incomplete again, but just that ability. And we clearly saw it on the Magne Jones touchdown of, of hitting his guy in stride, to your point about throwing a guy open, where like how many times and you know, if if when you tune into just you know American college football by by proc by by you know uh by comparison where so many of these offenses, it's like seemingly like uh, you know th- those offenses are so explosive and they're just getting their receivers in open space letting those guys make plays and how often is it so frustrating where we have great quarterbacks in our league um, but even some of those perhaps more mid-tier quarterbacks and I'll go back to you know, a guy like Ryan Lacandra where like you know I think his story is going to be uh, he was a very, you know, an, an average to perhaps above average at his, on his better day quarterback where it's like Man, you just missed your guy. Come on, it was there. Like the the the, the it was schemed up well, and he was there. And with with Evan, it, that that is almost never the case. As you said, he was perhaps under more pressure he's faced so far this year. And when we look ahead on their schedule, that certainly will perhaps be a story that they that he has to deal with again. But on the whole, um, just it's it's so promising. Uh, if you're a Western fan, just seeing his development, and uh, as you said, I mean, as a first-year player, being a Vanier Cup offensive MVP is a pretty great way to start your career and a high bar to have to lo- live up to. But he has those kind of, I don't want to call them intangibles, but those pro abilities in the way, not just in the arm talent, not just in how he can buy himself some time with his feet, but just the placement of these balls he's throwing to his guys. And he's got the talent there, obviously, on the receive again. But it's it, it really is a beautiful thing to be watching. Tom, so this is now, you know, we saw the back-to-back Yates Cups. We saw that beautiful game in London last year, the blackout game, the crowd being filled from what I, I was, I was at that game. From watching this one on the computer, I didn't I don't feel like the crowd lived up to what it was like in London? But obviously, hard to judge when I was at the one game and I watched this one on my computer. Did this feel like you know we've seen you know five now five matchups in three years between these two clubs, two of them being in the Yates? Did this feel like the most reminiscent we've had to like the glory days of Queen West Queens Western? And does that speak to? Once again, in the similar question I posed to as far as where Mack and Guelph are at based on that matchup, uh, Queens' continual ascension and growth. We've obviously spoken uh, so greatly about what Western's doing, how Evan's growing, um, but obviously we've talked about as a team, maybe they've come down to earth a little bit more. We've seen these clubs battled out so frequently in the last two, two and a half years. Where do you kind of pit this rivalry at? We obviously had them both in the A tier, given the nod to Western with us both picking them as our Yates teams. But what do you make of it now that we've actually got to see these two teams duking it out on the field? Yeah, um, just based off of the uh, the numbers that I see here, uh, U Sports is recording eight, just over 8,000 people at this game. So pretty sizable showcase. I think that stadium holds 15 10 to 15, if I if I remember correctly, something along those lines. So, you know, some still a ways to go. Anyways, the caliber of play that's on the field here is really outstanding. I think this, of all of the games that we have seen so far between Western and Queens in the Hillock Recon era, this is the closest that we've seen to like the 09 Yates Cup, like the 
top tier best of the best that the OUA has ever seen. If that that's the O9, this is still a number of notches below, but of all of the Western versus Queens, I think this is the closest to that. I think the, the teams are pretty evenly matched here. I think that the quarterback play was for the most part, really impressive. And uh, I was really happy with everything that I saw just purely being a fan watching this game. Now, want to make sure I'm specifically clarifying. I am not saying this game was as good as the 2009 Yates Cup. I have <laughs> not seen a game other than maybe the 2011 Vanier Cup. But once again, I have bias in that one that I, I think that 2009 Yates Cup is the best game that I've ever seen. It's got everything that you want in there. This was not that. This is the closest that I've seen from these two teams to coming towards that. So I think the caliber and play for both of these squads is getting better and better, or at the very least, it's getting more competitive. But regardless of it's competitive or not, or how you, you feel of it, it's still, if it's five times that they've played, it's 5-0 and Western. So how much of a rivalry is it right here? But Western Mustangs come away with another one. Yeah. Well, I, first off, Tom, just so people understand just how in insane yet lovable you are, how many times would you say in your life you've watched the 2009 Yates Cup? Oh my God! It's double digits, a hundred percent. I'm not even. I'm not even kind of joking. It's double digits. It's, did you ever? Did you ever watch that show, Queen's Gambit? <laughs> yes. You know she would like play chess like on her ceiling, just like in her head. <laughs> Is that you at this point where you just like watch the game, like projecting out your eyeballs when you can't sleep at night? Your wife's like, Tom, shut your eyes. I don't want to watch Danny Brannigan versus Michael. It's Paul just again. such a good game. It's a great game. What was the number on the attempts again? You said it was eight thousand, just something? over eight thousand. Yep. You know what? I I just I I had to pull up the Western Queens game from last year. Like I said, the one I was in attendance for the the blackout game, and this is from the Western uh, website. So you'd think that you know if they were going to juice the numbers, they certainly would. At seven thousand nine hundred eighty five. Mm. Um, fascinating. Uh, very interesting. I don't know what the max capacity of Western Alumni Stadium is, but you know, just the way they packed it and everything. But you know, as as our boy Nate Hobbs mentioned at some point last year in setting up, reviewing whichever it was, the Western at U of T game that we had, the 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 night game it was. Obviously, that was a much more uh, lopsided affair. Just going into the one and the result bared it out. But there is something about. You know, as fans of sports, it's the silly thing, of course, where we cheer for laundry at the end of the day. But my goodness, are there just certain combinations of laundry that just look better than <laughs> others? And when it's Western and U of T, and especially when it's Western and Queens, it's it makes for a, a beautiful affair, especially when you get the stadium filled up. It was the unveiling of the Lang Pavilion, uh, my understanding, from uh, tuning into the broadcast. And, uh, you know, it, that's... That's OUA football at its peak when we get those two clubs going at it. And when there's a a, a a margin of five points separating them and a touchdown in the waning minute, the waning seconds to put Western up ahead. Um, you know, if you don't if you don't enjoy that, you don't enjoy OUA football. Mm -hmm. And for Western, as we said, they return home next week to host the Ottawa GGs. Queens taking their show on the road to face the Windsor Lancers and uh, man, oh man, uh, you know, that in conjunction with a, a, a Western Windsor game the week after that, I mean, we're certainly going to have some questions answered for us. Uh, Tom, last thoughts on this week that we've been like, <laughs> we've been talking about this for a month and a half this this week four in the OUA. <laughs> yeah, I think this week really lived up to the expectations here. There were so many exciting games across the board here. And while I feel like I put a little bit of a damper on it because I was just so frustrated <laughs> with the play of my Marauders. Uh, I think across the board, we saw some outstanding play. Laurier and Taylor Elgersma looks just so impressive. Carlton seems to have found their groove, admittedly, against the York team. Guelph found some life and have injected some hope into this season. Windsor really looks like the real deal. And... Western Queens, another classic and a very long line of great, phenomenal games here. So this this week was just a phenomenal one for all of our OUA, our fellow OUA fans. And you get all of these conversations, all of these thoughts and opinions 
in just under two hours, like always, <laughs> uncut, unedited. I, I'm sorry, it drives Dakota crazy when he sees the timestamps that are going two hours. But you know, like I, I feel like if you are tuning in, you are absolutely enamored with the sport, with the league, as much as we are. And of course, as always, for everyone sending in your comments, your questions through whether it's Instagram, Twitter, just messaging us uh, if you have um, our contacts. Just thank you as always. Keep the conversation going. As we mentioned, a lot of the questions that we received, we are tabling for next week when we already kind of discussed wanting to take that post week five benchmark when all the teams will have played at least four games to discuss some of those things about checking in at the halfway point of the season where we think about individual award leaders where we find our own rankings aside from the standings of who's looking hot who's looking like the yates cup contenders and 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 everything involved in that but just as always uh thank you for your, your thoughts and your questions about all that thank you for tuning in however it is you're tuning in just you know we appreciate it immensely uh we have a very interesting slate of games coming up in week five can't wait to talk to you about all those things and much more later on this week at 55.